Welcome back, everybody. In this lecture, we're sort of hitting the home stretch on this class. In particular, we're going to have two more lectures left that detail specific types of disorders that can be examined in clinical psychology. We're going to try to do this on kind of the surface level, not necessarily dig into all the specifics of the disorders that we'll be addressing. But hopefully in doing this, we'll have, again, a better understanding of clinical psychology and also of just large portions of individuals in the population who might be struggling with either these disorders in particular or symptoms relating to them. In this lecture, the first of two big ones, we're going to be focusing our attention on anxiety disorders and technically mood disorders, even though as you're going to see when we progress, we're really just going to be focusing on one type of mood disorder in this lecture. We'll get to another type in our next lecture. As we get into these lectures, and in particular, start talking about specific disorders, I really want to make sure before we do so that we go into it with the right mindset. I've sort of foreshadowed some things in the last lecture that we want to think of as we're progressing through this stuff, but I feel it's really important to reiterate those things as we really do try to address some of the most sensitive topics that we've covered throughout the class. As I foreshadowed in the last slide, we are going to be talking about a number of different types of anxiety disorders in this lecture. We'll also be talking about one specific mood disorder in this lecture and then transition to other mood disorders in the next one. In the second half of our next lecture, we'll also be talking about a very well kind of discussed but not necessarily well understood disorder in schizophrenia. But as we look at different examples of these things and talk about symptoms relating to them and really go into a, a wide range of related topics within each of the disorders that we're going to be covering, it's important to keep in mind that when we're looking at these specific disorders, what we're talking about is things that people are struggling with on a day-to-day -day basis. And kind of defining people by the disorders that they might, because of what they're struggling with, fit into. It doesn't mean that we're defining these individuals. It's also important to really highlight that what clinical psychologists do when they give a disorder a name or try to kind of categorize it as different from other ones, what they're doing is taking a wide range of individuals with a wide range of problems and trying to figure out how we could come up with a term, an idea, to at least try to give others a, a sense of what they're struggling with and allow clinicians to explore not only potential causes and issues relating to it, but potential help for many individuals struggling with these things. And lastly, it's really important to note that even if individuals don't necessarily qualify as having a specific type of disorder based on the requirements or the specific things that are linked to them, that doesn't mean that clinical psychologists aren't capable of helping those specific individuals. People see clinical psychologists for a wide range of different types of issues. Again, it's not just about somehow magically fixing a specific disorder that somebody's struggling with. Clinical psychology is also about helping people with day-to-day -day struggles, addressing specific clinical issues when they do come up, and potentially just helping people get through the day-to-day -day with either mental health issues in tow or, or not. And understanding the nuances of this very science sensitive, a very important topic within psychology is something we want to do as you get to the end of your general psychology class. It does not mean that we're training you in this class to become clinical psychologist or we're treating these things in a dismissive way that's just kind of thrown out there at the end. It's hopefully, when addressing this at the end, a, a chance to really address this stuff from a scientific perspective in a way that hopefully you're, you're now more prepared to digest. And if you do decide to move forward, hopefully some of this information can be helpful as you think about other classes that you might take or other careers that you might pursue relating to psychology. With all of that said, 
it is probably a good time to get started on talking about specific types of disorders that fit under some of these umbrella categories that we'll address. And as I alluded to in both the first and second slide of this class, we're going to be turning our attention in the first portion of this lecture to an umbrella of classifications or disorders that we call anxiety disorders. There's lots of different types of anxiety disorders that exist, many of which we just simply don't have time to cover in a class like this. But what we're going to be turning our attention to in this one is some of the more prominent anxiety disorders that are out there, and ones that really do have a pretty dramatic impact on the lives of individuals struggling with symptoms that qualify them as having these specific types of anxiety disorders we'll be covering. But anxiety disorders in general, or any types of disorders that people have where their daily functioning has a, a persistent impact on them, and the, the symptoms that they're struggling with that are impacting their daily performance and things like school or relationships or work, it's extremely undesirable to the point where people decide to get help. Again, everybody struggling with anxiety doesn't qualify necessarily as having or being diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. But, you know, even if you're not, some of the things that we're going to be discussing in this class might be pertinent and might be informative just to kind of understand how clinical psychologists try to address this topic of anxiety in general. And this brings us to a really important anxiety disorder to cover first something called generalized anxiety disorder. The name sort of gets at what generalized anxiety disorder classifications are all about. When somebody is diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, it's usually because they've reported to a clinician that they're having some type of pervasive and, and free-floating anxiety that's having a really negative impact on their life. Now, oftentimes, people who struggle with generalized anxiety disorder tend to latch their anxieties, their worries, onto a couple things in particular. You know, it could be school or relationships or friendships or you know, just something that they think is maybe one of the more prominent sources of their stress. But what clinicians often find with people that are given this diagnosis is that this anxiety tends to just bubble up and manifest itself in many different aspects of these individuals' lives. These people often, when they start to experience stressors and reactions to things, report feeling tense, nervous, jittery, kind of unsure of themselves. But as a result of their constant, persistent anxiety, Outward manifestations of general anxiety disorder might sort of be different from what people report feeling internally. There are many cases of individuals who are diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder that look lethargic and detached, and this is often believed to be a byproduct of some of the sleeplessness and kind of scattered brain worries that many individuals unfortunately start to struggle with as their generalized anxiety disorder symptoms continue to persist. And this does persist for a long time. Usually people given a diagnosis with this have to report feeling symptoms for at least six months that kind of gets them past that threshold of qualifying as having this diagnosis. Mind you, I want to be very cautious when talking about this. That doesn't mean that if you're struggling with anxiety for four or five months, you just need to wait and potentially get a diagnosis by some month six. There's lots of ways to address this long before it gets to that six month threshold. And there's large numbers of individuals that struggle with problems that go well beyond just six months of their life. But the classification of generalized anxiety disorder, the kind of definition of it, is that these symptoms for individuals diagnosed with it have to be pre present for at least six months. If we're looking at the percentage of the population that meet these specifications, what we see right now, at least in the United States, is that the general population is, is diagnosed with this about 2 to 3 percent of the time. Um, at least at some point in time, you know, we will see about 2 to 3 percent of the population being diagnosed with this, give or take a little bit, based on environmental factors and other things going on. If we're looking at who's getting diagnosed with this, at least in the United States and 
other Western developed countries, what we see is that there are specific groups within the population that are being diagnosed much more than others. Historically, women have been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorders at any given point in time, somewhere between two to three times more often than males. We also see that individuals in lower to lower middle class income groups tend to be diagnosed with this more, and people that report persistent relationship issues also have a higher pension for being diagnosed with these things. This might lead us to think that if you fit into these groups, then, well, you're more inclined to being diagnosed with this. But it's really important to caution individuals about those conclusions. There are some in the clinical community that have argued that maybe when clinicians are trying to diagnose individuals reporting problems, they're simply more inclined to diagnose women than men when trying to figure out if somebody qualifies as having generalized anxiety disorder based on what they're reporting. There's also a belief that maybe relationship issues aren't necessarily the cause of things, but they're just kind of coming in tow with generalized anxiety disorder symptoms or it could be a reciprocal relationship. The point is, this is a complex disorder that does manifest itself in different ways with different individuals. We see certain groups within the population being diagnosed with it a little bit more than others, but why that's the case and what that means is unclear. And it's probably, to be honest, a complicated story. But if we're looking at just the raw data, this is something I want you to be aware of. I also want individuals in the class to be aware of the fact that this specific disorder, though very troubling and problematic for people who are struggling with it, is one that, in terms of kind of clinical work, is, I guess, not necessarily, I don't like to use the word curable, but it's, it's something that can be addressed. It's something that clinical work has proven to, to kind of have some tools in their disposal that have high levels of efficacy. If we're looking at the, the, the medical side of things, antidepressants, other types of uh, just kind of tranquilizers, even though antidepressants are used much more often, uh, have been proven to be medication tools that can be prescribed to help with certain cases of individuals diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. There's also, however, a lot of clinical approaches that have proven to be very effective for people struggling with these symptoms. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy approaches existing in a number of different forms have proven to be very effective tools to help combat some of the symptoms people report struggling with when they're diagnosed with this. And just stress reduction approaches have, have been proven to be very useful tools, especially sometimes when used in conjunction with medications to help people struggling with something like this for many years. Now, there are lots of concerns when we talk about generalized anxiety disorder, about historical chemicals that were used to help people struggling with this. There's issues with people reporting large amounts of, of kind of withdrawals when they go off of certain medication and individuals reporting high levels of addiction to specific chemicals that have historically been used. But in today's clinical world, an important thing to note here is that if somebody does start to present symptoms that qualify them as being diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, there are some options out there. There's lots of things that have proven to be pretty darn effective for a large number of the population that have been diagnosed with this disorder. And that's kind of a good thing to think of when we talk about these disorders. Many of them, even if they're extremely troublesome to people struggling with it, do have things that can help people with the symptoms, even if it doesn't necessarily completely remove the disorder itself from their, their diagnosis. And this is what we'll see in the next disorder we're going to look at as well. The next disorder that we're going to be discussing is something called panic disorder. Now, on the surface, at least by name, panic disorder sort of looks like generalized anxiety disorder. It sounds like it, at least. But in clinical terms, panic disorder manifests itself very differently from generalized anxiety disorder. Panic disorder 
by its name, kind of highlights what this specific anxiety disorder is mostly about. It's about large numbers of these things these people experience called panic attacks. Now, panic attacks for people struggling with panic disorder and just experiencing a panic, disorder, panic attack in general can vary dramatically from person to person. Some individuals talk about feeling very short of breath or feeling like they're maybe even having a heart attack or choking and they can't get in air. Others feel this extreme amount of fear where they need to get away from whatever it is they're encountering at that moment. And panic attacks can be triggered by something in particular for many of us who experience panic attacks. But for somebody diagnosed with panic disorder, these panic attacks start to occur on a relatively frequent basis, and they occur, theoretically, at random. There aren't specific things that seem to be triggering these panic attacks for many people diagnosed with this disorder. Technically, people who qualify as getting the diagnosis of panic disorder have to have several panic attacks for at least one month to be qualified as being diagnosed with this, but you know, there's ways to address people who start to experience panic attacks before they meet this specific criteria. But if we're looking at a numbers game, what we see is that roughly 3% of the population, so pretty much the same as what we saw with generalized anxiety disorder, is diagnosed with this disorder at any given point in time, at least in, again, the United States and other Western developed countries. What we see with panic disorder isn't necessarily groups of individuals that have a higher rate of being diagnosed with this, uh, even though there is a gender difference again for this one that's really unclear as to kind of why it's finding itself out there again. But what we see for this one, if we're looking at kind of one of the biggest predictors of panic disorder, is that there is a heritability factor for this one. If somebody's parents or a relative are diagnosed with panic disorder, the likelihood of those individuals developing symptoms related to it are much, much higher. And this kind of tells us that there might be something biologically at play when looking at when the symptoms of panic disorder start to manifest themselves. Many individuals have traced this specific disorder back to a system that we talked about long ago called the sympathetic nervous system. You might have heard of it as our fight or flight system. There's a lot of uncertainty as to what's causing this fight or flight system to be overactive and to sometimes activating when there doesn't seem to be a situation that dictates it. But most individuals have contended when looking at panic disorder that the best way to try to help people struggling with this is to figure out what's going awry with this specific system, what's causing it to be overly active across a wide range of different environments. If we're looking for things that can help with this. Medications, other types of drugs have proven to at least lessen the magnitude of the panic attacks that people are reporting. And we do see that as time passes, as people age, they tend to, whatever's going on with their biological systems, sort of age out of this, where the panic attacks over time become less robust and less frequent. But in trying to find the specific nerve clusters or the specific activities in the brain that are, are the source of this disorder is still a little unclear. So there are numerous clinical psychologists trying to find ways as we're exploring this to figure out how to both clinically and, and biologically help people struggling with symptoms that are defined as panic disorder. And we found a couple tools that do sort of work for some individuals within the population. And that's a good thing. That, that's definitely something that's desirable because people struggling with these panic attacks do really get oftentimes overwhelmed by these experiences. But you know, there's still a long way to go in exploring this specific disorder. Hopefully, if you take this class 10, 20 years from now, a little bit more knowledge on the topic. We're getting there. 
And, and I think this is much like the generalized anxiety disorder topic that we've talked about. A great way to kind of introduce ourselves to disorders so we can understand things that clinicians are looking for. But understand, you know, we're looking at people and researchers are doing their best when talking about these disorders to not only figure out why some of these things are happening, but how individuals struggling with some of the symptoms linked to them can be helped. And this brings us to another very prominent anxiety disorder. In fact, the most prominent one that's out there, something that really on the surface looks a lot like panic disorder, is what we call phobias. Now, the, the main difference between panic disorder and phobias is usually the fact that phobias tend to be placed on specific things. So people struggling with phobias, in, at least in clinical terms, are having very strong sympathetic nervous system reactions. But in this case, they're not random. They're to something in particular that these individuals have developed a phobia for. And if we're looking at their thought patterns on a daily basis, many of their thoughts that they're encountering reflect what we see in generalized anxiety disorder. It's just, again, it's not random. It's not general. It's usually something in particular that's being constantly thought about, worried about, and impacting day-to-day -day functioning. Now, it's important to note that when we talk about these really strong fear reactions and kind of our daily activities being impacted by it, we're talking about something that has a pretty darn high threshold in, in clinical terms is before it's qualified as being a disorder. Almost all of us have something that we don't necessarily react very well to. In fact, we might have a very strong fear reaction to if we encounter it. But if it's not creating something that's almost similar to a panic attack, and it's not something, and it's not something that's impacting our daily functioning, might not quite, at least in clinical terms, get past the threshold of having something that qualifies as a phobia. But you know, even with those high thresholds, we do see roughly seven to nine percent of the population qualifying as maybe being diagnosed with a specific phobia. Now, this number might seem relatively large, and it is. We're not saying that if we look in everybody's medical books, you know, one in ten individuals has some type of definition of having a phobia. But what clinical psychologists have argued or contended is that if we can guess uh, what percentage of people within the population could potentially, just based on what they're experiencing, qualify as having a phobia, they estimate that somewhere around 9% of the population are experiencing a phobia. And these phobias are often what we call comorbid with lots of other types of disorders that we've discussed so far and we will discuss in the remainder of these classes. Uh, phobias are very comorbid with panic disorder, where individuals struggling with panic attacks that seem to be coming from nowhere eventually tie them to specific things like the outdoors or social interactions or something, and those things eventually manifest themselves as not only panic disorder, but also a phobia. Same thing with generalized anxiety disorder or things like depression and other types of disorders that we're going to be talking about. But if a clinician is doing their job and accurate in their assessment of things, what they're doing to qualify somebody as having or at least meeting the, the, the criteria for having a phobia is they're looking for somebody who's got a very strong fear reaction to something in particular and it's impacting not just their behavior in that encounter, but their day-to-day -day functioning because of how strong this fear of that thing is. Now, it's important to also know when we look at phobias that these fears that people manifest have believed, at least by many psychologists, not just be formed randomly. There's dramatically different rates of phobias uh, for, for different things that people can develop fears for. And there are certain groups that have a slightly higher proclivity for being diagnosed with phobias than others. Gender does seem to matter here, 
stressful backgrounds, childhood encounters, do seem to matter here. And there is some research that suggests that there's probably some genetic factors at play as well. If we're looking for ways to help individuals, regardless of the source of these problems that people are reporting, what we see is that with phobias, much like with the previous two that we've talked about, even though these things can be very debilitating, somebody who's willing to get help, there's lots of techniques that can help. This is one of those moments where I really wish we were in person because I would have in the previous lecture showed you a video of a woman who has developed a very debilitating fear of snakes. I think I mentioned that before. And we would see how basic behavioral therapy can be a very effective tool against phobias like the one she was reporting. There's also tons of research that's shown that cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful. And if phobias are so strong that people don't really feel they can face them right off the bat without any type of help, numerous pharmacological therapies and types of kind of interventions, physical interventions, have proven to aid in people's exploration of how they can overcome their phobias as well. But I want to go back before we close out this topic on phobias with some research that, that really highlights how clinical psychologists are trying to address these things from a number of different angles. And this brings us back to where phobias are coming from. Now, as I mentioned before, there is considerable research that suggested that people do seem to have certain types of kind of genetic predispositions for developing phobias. But these genetic predispositions, many people believe, actually go beyond just having a higher likelihood of developing phobias. Numerous studies across multiple species have suggested that we might, as humans and other species, be more inclined to developing fears of specific things over other things. A particular example of this is things like fears of spiders or fears of snakes. And in fact, there was a researcher back in the 1980s and 90s named Susan Minica, who came to conclude that if we had a higher proclivity for things, we might be, if exposed to the right things, much more likely to develop a quick phobia of something through our basic experiences. Minica's work in particular, she used monkeys to show that developing a sphere of snakes might be something many primates are inclined to do, but this fear really tends to only pop up when we actually observe others displaying the fear. At least we see much higher rates of individuals developing these fears when they observe others showing the same fears. This is something that's depicted in the photo to the right. Where you see very few monkeys in her original study showing fears of snakes on their own, but when observing, either by watching another snake exposed to, or sorry, another monkey exposed to a snake, or even watching a television where a monkey is exposed to a snake and displaying that fear, you know, many monkeys suddenly display this strong fear. Minica's research and others have concluded this is exactly what happens with humans when we display fears of heights, uh, fears of enclosed places, of, of spiders, of snakes, of, of of numerous things that we seem to have kind of a, a predisposition to maybe developing these fears toward. But our research and other individuals studying this have also very strongly suggested that if we do develop these things, we not only need usually exposure, but we need sort of a proclivity to develop them in the first place. And this requires both the biology and the environment for these things to pop up. And this brings us back to what we talked about in our last class, the diathesis stress model. Remember, the diathesis is our biological predisposition for developing some type of mental health challenge. And the stress is the environment, the cues, the both mental and environmental, that really are kind of bringing out those things we might have a tendency to display in the first place. Numerous studies have suggested that the higher stress we're in, the more constraints we have put on us, the more likely we are to develop specific phobias. Not just specific phobias, but phobias in general. 
And there's numerous research that's also shown that as we learn to develop phobias through observations and we're more inclined to developing them if we have situational factors exacerbating it, we can also use this knowledge to help people overcome their fears. Albert Bandura, the famous personality psychologist that we spoke of earlier, showed in numerous studies that we can desensitize individuals of fears strictly through observing others and of lose those fears. And in fact, there was a researcher who spent a large portion of her career showing that systematic desensitization was not only something that could be done, but something that could be done very effectively for large numbers of individuals who develop phobias. And I think after covering phobias, we've reached a good place to stop in discussing these topics of anxiety disorders. We definitely have not gotten to the finish line of anxiety disorders. Many people diagnosed with a disorder that fits under the umbrella of anxiety disorders have not been covered in this class. But I think with the three that we've covered, we've sufficiently hit three of the more prominent anxiety disorders out there. And we spend some time looking at all the nuances of them so you have a better sense of a number of disorders that fit into this grouping. It's important to reiterate that obviously not all anxiety disorders are the same. There's different symptoms with them, different prevalences with them, different things to concern yourself with when looking at these things from a scientific perspective. Now, hopefully, now that we've done this, we're ready prepared to get into our next classification of disorders that we're going to touch up on in this class. In particular, what we're going to be doing in the remainder of this class and the beginning of our next class is looking at a grouping of disorders that we call mood disorders. Uh, much like anxiety disorders, the name kind of gives you a sense of what we're looking at with mood disorders. With mood disorders, we're looking at issues relating to mood. Usually we, we talk about negative affect, sadness, anger, etc. when looking at these specific types of disorders. But there are other affect issues that we're going to be looking at in our next class that, that, that actually go on the other end of the spectrum when we talk about something called bipolar disorder. So if we want to just define mood disorders in general and be precise, we're looking at classifications of disorders that fit into this category because individuals diagnosed with these disorders are struggling with something pertaining to mood and affect. I'm going to cover four total as we progress throughout this class and the next, but we're going to focus our attention in this lecture on the first one listed, depression. There's a lot of things that we can unravel when talking about depression. One of the big things we want to discuss first when talking about depression is that this is, if we're looking overall, one of the most commonly diagnosed disorders out there. At any given time, 7 plus percent of the population is diagnosed with depression. But other estimates across other countries and even within the United States suggest those numbers, especially with specific age groups, might be significantly higher. So we're looking at, when talking about depression, something that's diagnosed in a ton of individuals. We're also looking at something in terms of, kind of how it's diagnosed that ranges much, much more than all the other disorders that we've discussed thus far. And technically, many individuals diagnosed with depression report issues with negative mood and lethargic behavior. Yeah, they report thoughts revolving around things like not feeling worthwhile or not being able to get themselves motivated to do specific things. And yes, suicidal ideation is often tied to this specific disorder. But it's really important to highlight when talking about this specific symptom that this is not necessarily something that has to merge for somebody to qualify as being diagnosed with depression. Many individuals diagnosed with depression do not report suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideations. It hasn't even crossed their minds 
doesn't mean that the other symptoms that they're struggling with no longer qualify them as being diagnosed with depression. But, you know, if somebody does start to display those thoughts or start to even tinker with these ideas, there definitely is a much higher propensity, in fact, almost a certainty, of these individuals being diagnosed with depression. But if we go beyond those hallmark symptoms, we see depression can manifest itself in other ways as well. Individuals with depression often report some type of sleep abnormality, either a lack of sleep or too much sleep or a combination of things that make the circadian rhythms not function in the typical way that most people experience. There's also many individuals diagnosed with depression that don't necessarily just feel sadness, but instead feel things like agitation or fear or other kind of more negative affects. And in fact, because of this, this specific disorder is often what we call comorbid with a number of other disorders that we've not only talked about previously, but we don't really have the time to talk about in this class. So if we're looking for a way to pin down depression, it's really tough to do so. And this is also the case for where depression is actually coming from. Depression has been linked to the environment and stress, like we talked about before when talking about this diathesis stress model. There are genetic factors that have been tied to the prevalence of depression rates, and there's early childhood factors that have been linked to depression as well. There's also numerous studies that show that when people start to report symptoms of depression, it's not that they're just experiencing it in their minds, but we can see slight differences, changes in people's physiology as they're experiencing depression symptoms. And usually when we're looking at what triggers the onset of depression symptoms that gets people past a threshold of actually being diagnosed with this disorder, there's a multitude of different life events that have been historically linked to the emergence of not only the first onset of depression for individuals, but any recurrences once people do get diagnosed with this disorder. And this brings us to a really important point, and that's that when we look at how multifaceted depression is in terms of its manifestations and in terms of where it's coming from, we probably need to ensure that when trying to treat it, clinicians try to address it from these multifaceted areas as well. Numerous studies have shown that individuals, especially those struggling with mild to moderate depression, can often offset numerous symptoms relating to depression through altering some of the things that have been linked to triggers of depression symptoms in the first place. Getting regular exercise, changing your diet, encouraging some type of sleep hygiene where you set a clock and go to bed at a certain time and set an alarm so you can get up at a specific time have shown dramatic impacts on the reports of depression symptoms in individuals and places that incorporate these types of things have, even though it's a little bit less certain, shown lower rates of depression when these things are sort of institutionalized. This is also true for looking at how the body can be impacted by depression. So not only do we see chemical changes when people do these things, but certain types of drug interventions like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, something we've talked about previously, can do wonders for the brain mechanisms that are linked to depression and in doing so, do wonders for individuals struggling with symptoms of depression. And numerous psychotherapies also help with our exploration of what could be triggering thoughts and the emotions that people are experiencing. And in fact, numerous studies have suggested that very few psychotherapies out there are ineffective for this specific disorder. Again, it's sort of an individualized thing when we talk about the symptoms that people experience, and this is also true for psychotherapies. Not all psychotherapies are equal when it comes to specific individuals. It's just statistically as a whole, those who display symptoms that qualify them as being diagnosed with depression often respond overall fairly equally to all the different types of psychotherapies. Just, I mean, the best fit is obviously a critical thing when talking about things on the individual levels. But another thing that's important to know when we talk about how effective all of these things are is that when somebody starts to display symptoms of depression, regardless of which symptoms they are, 
this is, is not typically just a one-time thing. More often than not, individuals diagnosed with depression experience recurrences throughout their lifetime. They might see themselves getting better, and in fact, might see structural and, and, and kind of environmental changes that, that indicate that things are pretty much back to their version of normal. But if something could happen down the way, or something could shift within their biology, that there's a higher chance of what we call sometimes remission uh, into these depressive episodes for people who are diagnosed with depression. And this leads many people in the clinical community to argue that, much like all of the disorders we've talked about, there's a real importance of not only trying to help the individual at that time when they struggle with the disorder, but to be persistent in the help and ensure that these individuals experience kind of the lifelong benefits of research pertaining to clinical psychology, not just the momentary benefits of research looking at clinical psychology. Unfortunately, we have, as we're progressing, gotten better and better with this aspect of this topic. I think that sort of positive note on depression, all the things linked to it, but also all the things that we've been exploring to try to help individuals struggling with symptoms that qualify them as being diagnosed with depression, is a great place to end. Now, we're not done with mood disorders, if you didn't notice. We've still got more to talk about. And there's another disorder that's not necessarily as common as a lot of these mood disorders, but one that's very popular in the media and in conversations that many individuals teaching these intro classes highly suggest we should cover, and we will do so in this class. And it's called schizophrenia, and we'll talk about that one in the last half of our next class. And for today, we're going to close out. So I thank you again for all sitting tight. Hopefully, we've covered these things in an accurate and, and fair way that gives you a little bit better sense of, of not only how the clinical community looks at these things, but how you know we want you to, to be mindful of these, leaving this class and, and moving forward. If I've accomplished that, I'm just going to do it one more time. So please bear with me when we get into our next class. We'll try to close on a good note. For now, I wish you all the best. Take care, and I hope to see you soon.